It's time to step into the Coming Out Lounge, a cool, safe space to be true to your sexual self. With your host, Rick Clemens. Rick has helped hundreds of people come out of the closet, and now each week he's bringing you cool insights for loving and accepting yourself, boosting your self-confidence, and living a guilt-free, purpose-filled life on the other side of the closet doors. Cuddle up with yourself and get ready for heartwarming coming out stories, ideas for living authentically, and tips for being fully self-expressed. Now here's your host, Coming Out Coach Rick. Hello, Closet Busters. It's that time. You know what it is. It's time once again to stop the closet dwelling. And I want you to step out, step up. And yeah, I want you to step into living your powerful truth. And part of that powerful truth is, well, coming to that space where you feel really balanced. It's one of those things that I think for most of us as humans, we're really challenged to find the ability to balance between being ourselves and being what others expect from us. And then you factor in the fact that on top of that, we're gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender. And boy, that just gives the world a whole lot more stuff to have to contend with. But that's not to say that the gay people or, you know, transgenders, bisexuals, et cetera, are the only people who have to juggle, you know, sexual orientation, family life, friendships, et cetera. We all have things we're trying to bring into balance. But in my mind, there's an element of being gay that throws things even slightly more askew and off balance. So today we're going to talk about how, as you come through those closet doors, how to start to bring balance to all areas of life. You'll need to find ways to do this, whether it's relationships, work, friendships, etc. Finding that way to really bring balance into your life. And to help me do that is a friend of mine by the name of Mark Sprout. He's a father. He's a partner to a wonderful guy. He's an entrepreneur. He's a speaker and a life enthusiast. And he's a fellow coach. So I'm going to bring Mark to the show right now, and let's just see what we can uncover about bringing more balance into our lives. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks, Rick. I'm glad to be here. Hey, I'm glad to have you here too, man. And I'm just going to say Mark's kind of already kind of, I don't know, found some balance. He just came back from vacation, so (laughs) I'm hoping he's a little balanced as we're doing this show today. But anyway, I know you just had a great vacation, didn't you, Mark? It was wonderful. Beautiful weather, lots of rest and relaxation. Yeah. But I think sometimes we as humans and, you know, all the things that we do, even just taking a vacation is sometimes hard to even find the balance in that and to let ourselves, you know, relax down and cut loose and do those sort of things. I know for me, and I'm going to bring us right into the conversation around coming out, it was one of the hardest pieces of the adjustment for me, which was really to find a way to let myself just fully find balance in my gay life. Mark and I have a couple of things in common. We're both gay men and we both came out a little bit later in life and we both have kids. So why don't you give us a little bit of your background on how you came to your own coming out journey, Mark? Sure. I came out when I was 27, 28 years old. By then I already had four kids. Wow. I was married for six years, had four kids. I mean, I guess we worked pretty quickly. After the divorce, I I spent a few years just trying to find myself and finally had some experiences that led me into my own gayness, finding those pieces that were always missing for so many years before. And the kids by then were, I don't know, five, four, three, and two, somewhere in that neighborhood, all, all four of them. Right. And what were those pieces that were missing for you? I mean, obviously, the you know, the obvious thing, oh, I'm gay, but what... Were there other things that were really missing as well? Mainly the intimacy that I was looking for and, and couldn't find, you know, in the opposite sex at all, even after the divorce. And we got divorced mainly because we couldn't get along. I didn't come out to my ex-wife until years later. Mm. Uh, so it's a little different. Yeah. But I think that's the thing that a lot of people also tend to forget in these different kinds of coming out stories is, Sometimes the reason someone comes out isn't because of the relationship they're in. Sometimes they get out of the relationship they're in, and then once they get out of that, yes, the other stuff starts to show up, but sometimes it can just be the relationship's just not working. I mean, that's yeah. plain and simple. And then once we release ourselves to, oh, okay, well, now that that's kind of out of the way, I can see a little bit clearer, even though that may not become immediately apparent as soon as you've gone through the divorce and separated the other parts of, oh, and I happen to realize what's really missing is my gay life. That's the other piece of the puzzle. 
So how long after the divorce did you start to really discover these other pieces for yourself? Probably a year or so after, you know, maybe nine months to a year after the divorce, I finally had my first encounter with another man and realized at that point immediately, like, oh, this is what was missing. You know, just the intimacy that I could feel, the, the connection that I could feel was missing. How do you define intimacy? Just because I know everybody has a little bit different take. What was that intimacy for you? Was it just the sex or was it something more than that? It was something more than that. It was more about the compatibility, the companionship, the energy vibration that we shared in that space. And, and yeah, there was some sex too. Well, of course. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's part of it, right? But uh, no, I, I find it always so interesting that, you know, sometimes people jump to these conclusions of, oh, intimacy. Well, that means it was all about the sex. And I know, I believe we're moving to a space where intimacy doesn't get immediately wrapped around the word sex all the time. But I think there's still a tendency at times for those two to be interchangeable. And I know they can be to some degree, but I want to make sure that we you know as people are listening, they, they start to define their own terms for what does intimacy mean and what does sex mean for them. So you had this encounter, and then what began to happen for you? I really began to have some anxiety around you know what's going on, first of all. And right. you know, I tried to date men and women both, and you know, I tried to, again, put that mask on of, of being a straight man, right. doing what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. So, you know, I struggled back and forth and back and forth and, of course, you know, snuck around and such. Even even though I wasn't married and I was free to do whatever I wanted, you know, I, I still snuck around and mm -hmm. was in the closet about it pretty much. And this is something I, I'm not really sure people are prepared for when they come out, especially if they've come out of a, a relationship, heterosexual, quote unquote, heterosexual relationship. I'm not 100% sure most of us are prepared for, okay, now that I'm out, I can kind of go do my own thing. And this isn't just necessarily a gay thing, because I've watched this with heterosexual friends who've gone through divorce, and then it's kind of like, okay, how do I get back in the saddle, so to speak? But giving yourself the permission to say, okay, I can go do this, it's kind of uncomfortable, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. It is. And Everything you said there is, is exactly it, but but then you add on the part that you've got kids, yeah. and you know you you have to attend their school functions, yeah. you know, as their father and be supportive, and still come in contact with their mother and her parents and you know aunts and uncles and sure. all that. How do you do that when you're gay and trying to be this father role model to your children right. uh, without? hurting the children at school or, you know, causing them any, any anxiety about, you know, their dad being gay or whatever. It's all difficult, sure. very difficult to well, navigate. And your kids were fairly, fairly young at that stage, too. I mean, were, they were mm -hmm. still under most, all of them were under 10 years old by that point, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's such an interesting dynamic, I think, that when the parent comes out has a deep impact on the kids and how the parent comes out and how the other spouse interacts around this. But what you brought up around the whole spider web of other people is a whole other dimension to what's going on here that most people who have never been in a committed or, you know, heterosexual type relationship prior to coming out of the closet it's just a different ball game, And I know we've talked about this numerous times on this show, but I think it's imperative that we cover the topic again, because it's going to happen. It's going to be part of your dynamic. And I don't know that any of us are completely prepared with, okay, so here it is. The first, as you just said, the first school event or the first event where, you know, it's a birthday party or any of those things. How do we navigate that? So how did you? <laughs> Loaded question there, Mark, but um, how did you? Well, it's fair, very fair question. You know, I I pretended. For many years, I pretended to be a straight, single man, father coming to my kids' events or sure. you know, birthday parties or whatever. I pretended. I never brought a date or a significant other to those events. You know, occasionally, I'd bring a girlfriend or something, you know, somebody that my kids knew. Right. You know, as one of my friends, one of my network. Mm -hmm. but never shared those moments with anybody that was really special to me. 
you know, I'm consistently just hiding behind all of that. Well, I imagine that just continued to add to the feeling of I'm kind of being me, but I'm still got one foot in the closet, one foot out of the closet. Yeah. I compare it to wearing different masks. Yeah. And when you have these different masks on and kind of driving towards the point of today's topic of, you know, what is it like to be really well balanced? How difficult is it when you're wearing all these masks to find a balance? It's completely exhausting. You've got, of course, so the mask we talked about, you know, with the family and the kids. Then you've got a mask at work even, and then another mask for your significant other, your partner, or whoever you're dating at the time. Right. Plus maybe another mask for your own family. Sure. So you're balancing all of these pieces, and it's overwhelming and exhausting. Yeah, it is. And one of the things that I often bring up when I'm working with clients is, the fiction is so much more fictional than the truth that we think we've got going on. I mean, it's like, Oh my God, this, this is such a fictional story yet. How do I get myself out of this? You know, because you have to balance. There's certain things. Okay. I got to balance this with the ex in-laws and then I got to balance this with the kids at school. And then I'm balancing this at work. And then I balance with my own parents, as you said. And then of course, if you're one of those people who is fortunate enough to find someone to be with, then you have a whole different balancing act with that partner, significant other, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it may be, that I would assume, just from my own experience in watching this with other clients, that that puts another whole kink in the relationship too. Of Okay, well, you're acting this way with these people and this way with these people, and then you're acting this way with me. So did that ever crop up in your early dating life with guys that, okay, there's just way too many different stories going on? Or Yeah, it did. It did. It made our relationships suffer quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And even to the point where, you know, I would have visitation with my kids. And, you know, I was probably in my mid-30s, close to 40 by the time I started cohabitating with significant others. And they would kind of exit the scene and stay in the bedroom or, you know, go in the basement and hide out or something, you know, they just wouldn't participate because, you know, the kids were there. Right. And, you know, I don't want to walk away so much from the kid conversation, but something you just said kind of brought me back to a space in my own journeys, but just, just the cohabitating with somebody. How was that for you? That first time or times that you actually said, okay, I'm actually doing this with somebody new. How was that experience for you as a gay man? That was comforting because I, you know, I'd found my true relationship, I suppose, you know, the the man that I wanted to spend my life with. Right. So I thought, but you know, it it was wonderful. It was comfortable. Do you, and I'm going to speak from my perspective and then throw the question at you. Did you ever feel that that comfort came as, okay, this is what I need to get through this, and then discovered, oh, I was leaning too much on this to get me through this, but this wasn't really the match? I mean, are you with the same guy that you're kind of referring to right now, or is it somebody completely different? Oh, it's somebody completely different. It took me several attempts to get the right guy, but uh, I think that happens to a lot of people. Well, I do too, and I think this, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to try this. It's tough. I mean, it's really, and I'm not saying it's tough just because we're gay. I think this is something that anytime we go start to create lives with other people and date and then try the cohabitating and however that works and all that, it's really tough. But I, I know for me, and I've seen it again in many clients, the same sex, just doing the cohabitation piece, there's something about it especially for men. I don't see it so much with women and I don't want to do this stereotypical lesbians, you know, they just can do this. But I think there is an essence to women somehow do the cohabitation thing a little bit easier. Whereas us gay men, we want it, but there just seems to be some interesting masculine energies that we got to kind of navigate through that I know I wasn't trained how to do that. That wasn't on my sex 101 courses. So I'm wondering how was that something you saw on your own journey as well? It is. And it sounds stereotypical, but, you know, I think women tend to be more homemakers, I suppose. And and the guys are, you know, free spirited. I I don't know if that's the word to use, but they're kind of in and out. So, you know, of course, we had a lot of in and out and up and down and power struggles within the home. Sure, sure. 
So the work you do these days is around helping people really find balance. So how much did your own journey begin to guide you towards doing this work of helping people as a coach find balance in their life? Well, started in the early 2000s, and I thought there just has to be something more, right. something out there that's just not fitting. And I started studying metaphysics, mm-hmm. and it, it's a lot about energy and consciousness, and realizing that, you know, all will be well, all will be fine, everything's going to be okay. I just need to have patience, first of all. Where it came to the kids, I realized I had to have a lot of patience because you know, the ex's situation was she remarried. And at the time it was, you know, she had custody and I had visitation. That's just how a divorce works. So she would tell the kids that being gay was wrong and her husband would support her and and try to be a father to my kids. And I just had to realize that, you know, this, my kids will see through this and they will come through and love me for who I am. And, you know, it took me a lot of study and practice and meditation and you name it, I did it. But, and the kids did come through. I, you know, just had a lot of patience. But I think one of the key points you just brought up that often is, again, a thing that gets stepped over, missed, jumped past, whatever metaphor we want to use is we will be okay. Mm -hmm. But if we don't feel that and believe it and be intentional about that belief system within ourselves then it's not going to come to us. And now I'm going to caveat that by saying it's going to be okay in a way that best serves us. Not always going to be the okay that we have, you know, drawn out in our beautiful fairy tale story of how life's going to be. But I often, myself included here, look at, okay, those moments when I thought things weren't going to be okay. And then a day, a week, a month, a year later, I go, when was that that I had that feeling? I couldn't even tell you because mm-hmm. things are okay. So as you struggled with somewhat the differences, and again, we're talking about the balance here because there's where the balancing act started to happen is, you know, with the ex and telling the kids that, you know, being gay was wrong and all these things. I'm assuming that there started to be some real big shifts for you as you were doing this seeking to try to figure out, okay, well, there's got to be something more. What? kind of talk us and walk us through those shifts that you continue to discover? I think what it was, was I realized that, you know, I've come quite a long way and I'm still here and I'm still pretty settled into the way life is now. Life is good. So the way I got there was, again, through these studies, through metaphysics, through meditation, through other journeys of that nature. And then getting into my coaching business, realizing, you know, I've got something here that is unique and the ability to give this back to people and and help people like us who are struggling to pull through some of these things. Well, I think sometimes the pulling through is, it is pulling. I often wonder, why do we feel like we have to pull or push through these things instead of just, part of the balance to me is just being these things. And, and I'm speaking from experience, you know, as we're recording this today, I I woke up this morning and I was like, okay, I'm pushing through some stuff. I'm trying to pull myself through some stuff I'm trying to get through. And I'm like, stop. If this was a client right now, Rick, you would be telling them, why don't you just be? You know, I'd put my coach voice on and go, well, why don't you just be this way, you know? So I put my coach voice on with myself and said, okay, why can't you just be with this today? This is just what is today. It's not the definitive of what will be forever. And I think that's a big piece of this balancing stuff. So as you work through this balance stuff, why did helping others find balance really become important to you in this work that you're doing? It's become a passion. You know, I see the struggles. I see the pain in people. Even walk down the street or go to a restaurant, whatever. I I just see that anxiety and pain. And, you know, I want to reach out and say, you know, it's going to be fine. Isn't and that I can, interesting, though, how you can just... And I, I catch myself doing this all the time, too. And it's not because I feel holier than that. I'm not coming from that perspective. Mm-hmm. But I will be in a car, mostly in a car, because out here in the L.A. area, it seems that's where we live, besides the little bit of time we spend in our homes. We spend the rest of the time in our cars. But I always like just kind of looking around when I'm stuck there in traffic and just looking at people's faces and going, nobody seems to be happy. Very rarely will I see somebody chatting with a friend or on a phone or something, their face is just lit up. And I think, wow, 
we're all so conditioned this way, even myself, because I'll be sitting there going, damn it, why can't this traffic be moving, you know, and I'm in my head about it and all this good stuff. But oftentimes it's like, man, there's a better way. There's just a better way. It sounds like that's what you're trying to bring people to. That is it. That's it exactly. And just letting go and letting it be. To your point, yeah, we all put pressure on ourselves to do what we think needs to be done or what society is telling us. You know, in the end, it's just, let's just let it go and let's just be. So Um, if somebody's struggling with that, how would you help a client really step into that? Well, right now what I've been working with in well-being in that arena is just taking five pieces of well-being in sort of a balancing act, if you will, like financial well-being, physical well-being, community well-being, career well-being, and social well-being. Mm-hmm. And creating a balance, like if you put all of those as spokes on a wheel, creating sort of a wheel out of that, placing yourself on a continuum on that wheel, where are the bumps? Where are the flat spots on the wheel? Right. Working through that, understanding that your financial well-being does have an effect on your physical well-being and community well-being, et cetera. So, yeah, I think you're on to something here, and I'm sure people have heard it in different ways, but I like the way you're putting this into the frame or the visual drawing of a spoke because each thing does integrate. And I know this probably may not be news to some people listening, but some of them hoping it will strike a chord that one of my mentors always says, whatever is happening in your business is a direct reflection of what's happening in your personal life. And what's happening in your personal life is a direct reflection of what's happening in your business. And the first time I heard him say it, I wanted to say, yeah, f- <laughs> you know, and then I'm like, no, that would be me. That needs to be told f- because he really had some really beautiful, powerful wisdom in that statement. And I'm hearing the similar kind of wisdom here by finding these different balances. So when somebody's identifying this balance in their financials and their physical well-being, do you encourage them to try to find one in each area or start with one or two first and then work around? Generally start with one or two first and work around because what what you'll notice is that when you increase the value of that one or two, the others will fall into line too sometimes. Yeah, and I've seen that happen with clients as well. So someone who is coming out of the closet, I mean, I think this is the toughest pieces is realizing that your coming out journey is going to touch every aspect of life, physical being, your emotional well-being, you know, some of these we already know. It's just like, okay, yeah, my emotional well-being is going to be big time touched by this. But oftentimes I don't think they realize how it can impact you financially outside of yes if you're going through a divorce you'll get that piece but i think sometimes people don't realize there's little pieces of all of life that are going to get touched by this so this kind of plays what you were just talking about mark is these different you know spokes on the wheels so to speak of okay where can you find the balance so if someone is seeking balance you know if i was your client right now what would be some ways you would encourage them? You know, I know we've got the spoke in the areas, but what would be if they're like, okay, Rick, you know, it sounds like you really are striving for balance in, let's just say, my physical well-being. What would be one of the ways that you would guide them into that space? Well, sure. Using the example of physical well-being, I'd like to know what that means for, for you or the client. You know, what physically do you want to change or to work on, whether it be even your weight, your, your diet, you know, you might be struggling with an appearance, something going on that, you know, has been there for a long time, you know, something new physically. And we'd work through coaching questions. I'd really want to know what that meant to you as a client. You know, it's so interesting to me. And I guess because as coaches, we, we do this a lot day in and day out with clients. But what I find so interesting is when I give, as if I'm like the master guru, <laughs> when I give a client these questions, I do see it as a gift. It's like I'm giving you this gift of these kind of questions in the hopes that you'll be able to start taking those and working them into your life in your own way so that you can ask yourself these questions. I find it interesting when I actually say to a client, I'm giving you the gift of this question. They kind of get this perplexed look on their face if I'm working with them face to face or I can hear it in their tone of voice. Or sometimes they'll just say, well, what do you mean? And I I will say, I'm giving you this gift of this question so you can use it with yourself when you come up against this again, because we will all always come up against something similar to what's going on at that point in time. And as I do that, I see them begin to open up a lot. 
it's now part of theirs. It's part of their toolkit that they can take off and use on their own. What do you do in cases where you find, I'm just curious because I think a lot of the coming out process stumps most of us in some ways, where they just feel really stumped and stuck by trying to get to this well-being place? What if they can't define what that is for themselves? I would take a back step, I suppose. You know, I still would ask questions about what life should look like for him, you know, mm-hmm. or for the client, I should say. So then the definition of well-being might be something totally different, and that's okay. It's just starting where the client is. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting that you do this work, and so I'm going to ask you a very loaded question right now. Okay. What does well-being mean to you? It means perfect balance of life energy. Let's just leave it at that. You know, it's just just the balance of life energy so that you feel fulfilled in all areas of your life, you know, whether it be financially. And, And like when I say financial, I don't mean about the money that you make. I also mean about the money that you give. So giving and receiving both. So again, finding that balance so that I can find fulfillment in my life. I guess that pretty much sums up what well-being is for me. I find it interesting, too, that when we get asked these big questions, like how would you define well-being or what does fulfillment look like to you or describe happiness to you, a lot of people struggle. A lot of people struggle to answer those questions. And I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, if you see that and why you think that is that we struggle so hard with those kind of questions. I was thinking about that just the other day about some of those hard questions. I really feel like they're out there to they challenge us because there's no right or wrong answer. Right. It's going to be a little different for every person. So I, I think I, that's the key, though, is a realizing it's going to be different for each of us. You know, along the lines that you said you've been thinking, about, I've been thinking about it a lot, I guess, because I know I'm shifting. Lots of shifts in my life, business, personal, a lot of things are shifting in really beautiful ways. But in fact, I was just reading something where a friend of mine, Chris Gillibu, who he runs World Domination Summit, and he's written the book, The Art of Nonconformity, and a few others. He posted on his Instagram about how when you're ready to make the shift, the shift may not be ready for you because you're not really ready for the impact. And until you're ready for the impact of the shift, then you can't make it happen. And so I've been asking myself a lot of these bigger questions. And I think the reason we don't get there is because if I said to you right now, Mark, define happiness, I think instantaneously most of us go to some predefined thing that we've heard somebody else say. Mm -hmm. But when I say, Mark, I want you to define happiness for you as only you would define it in your own words for yourself, not based on anything anybody else has said, suddenly a lot of people would freeze up and go, oh, shit, what am I going to yeah. do this? Put on the spot, yes. Yeah, because you're put on the spot. So. Yeah. So it's hard to believe that we are already at 30 minutes into this podcast. It goes by really fast. And one of the things that I always appreciate about having other coaches and people who do this beautiful work on the podcast is we always end up with really rich content to share with the world. And I'm just curious, one of the things I I would love to know, Mark, as you come through your own journey and continue to do it, because it is a lifelong journey, everyone, what would be some of the advice you would love, maybe in the area of wellness and well-being, or just in general, what would be some advice you'd love to leave the listeners with around their own coming out journey and, and really finding balance? Well, Simply just do it. Take the leap. It's fine. And I think being fine is something that a lot of us, I know when I used to hear that word fine, it like used to make hairs on the back of my neck just kind of curl. It's like, well, what does that mean? But I think that's part of growing. That's part mm-hmm. of us stepping into letting things be okay, letting things be a little crazy and chaotic at times, letting things just be fine. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be wonderful they can just be fine that's it and being comfortable with it Mm -hmm. because i think the sooner we become comfortable in certain emotions words feelings the sooner we can be comfortable in those kinds of things then the easier life becomes 
that makes sense. That does. Yeah. Well, I just really appreciate this conversation we've been having today, Mark, and I appreciate the insights you've been given. What I'd love to know is if somebody wanted to chat with you and do a little work in the balancing their life and well-being area, how could they get a hold of you? What's your website? Website is www.outwardtruthcoaching.com. Big long one. Or you can just go to www.otcoaching.com. Awesome. Great. And I hope some of you that have been listening will take advantage of, you know, checking out Mark's site, the work that he does, because there is a big piece of the coming out journey that is around balance and finding ways to financially, spiritually, emotionally, physically, all those different areas we've talked about, finding the balance because each area will be impacted by it. And speaking of finding some balance, hey, if you could help us balance out and and really draw some more people to the podcast, we would greatly appreciate it. We love all the listeners that we have, and we love when we see the shows getting shared because that means each person is giving this gift to someone else to help them in their lives. So any sharing you can do via iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, we would greatly appreciate it. As always, if you want to tweet about the show, you can do so by using my Twitter account, which is at Rick Clemens, and the hashtags pound coming out lounge or pound the coming out lounge either one and with that uh, i think we're going to wrap it up for this week don't forget if you haven't already go see if you can find a copy of my book on amazon or barnes noble the book is frankly my dear i'm gay we'd love to have you guys download it in kindle the audio version should be out shortly or if you want to just get a nice hard copy of it it would be great hopefully you'll find some tips and tricks and hear a little bit more about rick and his coming out journey but with that we're going to call it a wrap and say Never stop stepping out, stepping up, and stepping in to living your powerful truth. I'm Rick Clemens, the Coming Out Coach, and you've been listening to the Coming Out Lounge. You've just experienced the Coming Out Lounge. Go online to www.comingoutlounge.com to learn more. And tune in again next week for more stories and tips for being true to yourself. 